it is time. So maybe on uh, we can start and I will continue letting people in. Okay. So thank you so much for joining and participating tonight. This will be the first event of the year for the association for the 2021. And we are very happy to kick off with the, so many participations tonight as who have joined us. Uh, we started eventually to plan this event for ending last year, 2020. And we had a total different planning from the beginning that we were kind of optimistic and wanted to meet in real life. But soon we had to acknowledge that it, was, that it wasn't possible. So we listened to the members and the members were kind of getting tired of uh, Zoom. Perhaps we will have a new expression for this year, Zoom fatigue and not only pandemic fatigue, but we will see. But uh, Annika and I had a chat and um, we started thinking, how can we do something different and how can we still connect together? And um, how can we think differently? And then soon Tom's name was mentioned and we all of a sudden saw the possibilities of Zoom and not being tired of Zoom, but see, seeing the possibility of inviting somebody in for this evening seminar that we hadn't had the possibility to do before. Uh, and since Annika is one of the persons that I know that uh, actions speak louder than words, she contacted uh, Fredrik and Linda very soon and soon the work was, was going on. Uh, so, so here we are tonight and um, the reason I'm sharing this story is because sometimes, and I think we can all recognize this, that sometimes when you think that you're really stretching and daring and doing something that you're asking perhaps a little bit too much and still, yet you, you proceed to do it. You also get very surprised by the answer that you receive back. And I think many of us has experienced that with clients who has been trying to reach out and they will come back and they will tell, I never expected this answer. So I guess that's the same way that we feel tonight that we were so happy that Tom accepted this invitation for tonight and also that he that his reply was that he would like to do it and the fee that we were planning to pay him he is donating it back to the association tonight so we are very thankful for that and in order for that i would like to ask all of you who is participating tonight to kindly return this uh, generosity by sharing this evening with family, friends, colleagues, and clients perhaps, and pass this message on to the world, the same way that we will be receiving it tonight. So we are very, very grateful for having this evening. And also a big thank you to Linda and Fredrik who will also be participating tonight. So we have a short agenda and uh, Tom will give a short con context of his book, Holy Fire. And then Linda and Fredrik will continue an interview with Tom. And after that, it will be possible for you to leave um, questions in the chat. And also some have already left questions uh, by emails since we are so many participating tonight. But first I would uh, like to give the words to Annika and she will instruct you on a little bit of technical details. Yes, thank you, Anna. Uh, after such a heartwarming welcome, I will go into some practical matters. And the only thing I would like to say is for all of you to turn off your microphones. I think you have already done that. Uh, and when you, whenever you have a question, please just send me a message in the chat and I will, um, with the power 
of the chat master. I will select the questions and, and forward it to Tom and Frederick and Linda, but I hope I will manage to cover all of them. Uh, and if there's anything other technical or something you would like to ask, just sort of you can chat me directly or uh, to all of the group. So with that, I would just uh, like to say hi to Frederick, Frederick Lund. Hello. <laughs> hey, Frederick. Hey. Uh, and I have been given uh, the pleasurable task of introducing Tom for those of you who haven't met him before. There's so much I could say about you, Tom, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I, will, I will start by saying that, that Tom is one of the people who has been in psychosynthesis since the early days. Uh, Tom trained in Italy uh, with Roberto Asadioli together with his wife, Anne and was also one of the pioneers of psychosynthesis in the United States. And, and when I think of you, Tom, one of, one of the things that come to mind is that um, to me, you've always been a person that connects people, uh, brings people together. And uh, I know that one way you have done that in the US is by being active organizing conferences previously in the 80s and 90s uh, uh, and editing uh, anthologies on psychosynthesis. But you've also done it internationally. So Tom uh, was part of a citizen diplomacy initiative in the late 80s when uh, the Soviet Union was about to open up. So together with some colleagues, Tom visited the Soviet Union and met colleagues, uh, psychologists, psychotherapists uh, in, so in the Soviet Union. And one of the results of this is uh, the founding of the International School for Counseling and Psychotherapy in St. Petersburg, where Tom was a co-founder and has been involved uh, as a trainer and as a board, uh, I think a director of the board. Uh, so that that's, and, and also as a very dear friend, I know, of of the Russian founders uh, in St. Petersburg. And th that's another thing that comes to my mind is that uh, your professional co cooperations always seem to have a ground in friendship. Uh, and and that's, that's one thing I really want to highlight. Uh, I also want to say to those of you participating tonight who are connected to the Psychosynthesis Academy that uh, Tom supported the Academy very actively in a crucial time of our history. Uh, when our first director, Margot Russell, passed away, uh, Tom stepped in to support us as a trainer and as an advisor quite actively in, in that period, which was very important for us. And uh, before I hand over to you, Tom, I also want to mention that we gather here in, in the context of psychology, but I know that your own soul expression comes in many different forms. So. Tom has published uh, poetry, he's a painter, and he's made a CD of music. <laughs> so, <laughs> so psychology is, is one of the ways, uh, but not the only way. So I thought I will hand over to you, Tom, and you can start by giving me a little bit of context about your book and the background for it. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Frederick. You know, um, I'm very happy to be here and, and Frederick's mentioned, but I just want to say again that uh, I've had a, a close association with the Academy over the years, starting when Margot had just died and I came and was part of that grieving and also reorientation to life after the founder. And uh, I remember walking with Frederick once somewhere and I said to him, Frederick, you know, I'm really more European than American. And he said, I think that's right, Tom. And I feel a particular affinity with Swedish, uh, with Sweden and with the Swedes that I've known. And that relationship has continued through training programs, a summer institute a couple of years ago, uh, a strong friendship with Frederick and others. and. Uh, and with Linda, I want to say, Linda, I knew first as a student, and now she's a trainer. And she's also married to a very dear friend of mine, uh, David Elliott. Uh, so only just say that I'm very, uh, very glad to be here. And I feel at home. 
I guess, except I don't understand a word of the language. So when there were technical difficulties, I realized that my presence was keeping people speaking in English. So I, I disappeared and immediately the problem was solved in uh, Swedish. So, so um, the main focus is going to be uh, Frederick and Linda interviewing me or talking together. We're very much doing this together. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to just speak a little bit about the context uh, within which I wrote this book. And a way of doing that is to remind you in a couple of ways what a Roberto Assagioli's vision was. So I'm actually gonna to read to you a couple of passages from the book, his book, Psychosynthesis, which was published in 1965. And it's so amazing to remember how broad and deep and comprehensive Roberto Assagioli's vision was. Most of us have learned it through the medium of individual work, and in some cases, group work, educational work, psychotherapeutic work, so forth, now coaching. But his vision was not of a particular psychology, it was of an orientation really to life at all levels. And in that first book, which was a compilation of his previous writings, listen to this. Let us feel and obey the urge aroused by the great need of healing the serious ills which at present are affecting humanity. Let us realize the contribution we can make to the creation of a new civilization characterized by harmonious integration and cooperation pervaded by the spirit of synthesis. So his agenda is really to transform human civilization. And I think that's important to remember that he was seeing our work in that, within that context. The second quote is, we seem to sense that whether we conceive it as a divine being or a cosmic energy, the spirit working upon and within all creation is shaping it into order, harmony, and beauty, uniting all beings, and then parentheses, some willing, but the majority as yet blind and rebellious with each other through links of love, achieving slowly and silently, but powerfully and irresistibly, irresistibly the supreme synthesis. I remember reading those, those passages as a 30 year old and just resonating, just, yes, this is, this is what I've been looking for. And the other moment for me in that same book, someone told me I should read Psychosynthesis by Astro Jolie because he was interested in guided imagery. The minute I saw the egg diagram, I said, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. So the context of the book that I've written now, uh, you know, at the beginning of my 80s, rises out of that. And I really spent, I would say, 50 years within that context once I discovered it. And I've actually recently looked back to my, my previous life as an adolescent and a young person, and I realized that I was connected to that vision. I just didn't know it. The only difference is that at that moment, I realized that this was what I wanted to do. Now, another thing interesting about this is there's a, uh, on YouTube, there's a, a videotape of Roberto being interviewed by a man, a doctor, uh, Evarts Loomis. And it was, it was made uh, maybe a couple of years before he died. And uh, Loomis brings him out in the little garden in the back and he, he has his white hat and his smoking jacket and his little bird-like old man and uh, sits down. It's a five minute video. And in that five minutes, 
he articulates that same vision, talking about the whole world at all levels, moving toward what he called an organic unity, which is in a sense, another word for the supreme synthesis. So it's so marvelous just to have his life bookended that way. He, didn't, he held that vision throughout. And at the same time, he was very happy to help people wherever they were and in whatever fields they were. Uh, he, and he, was, uh, he, he supported many people in many countries. And of course, that's continuing now. Um, and people are, have applied the, the principles of psychosynthesis in other fields besides psychotherapy for sure. Anyway, the book uh, rises out of that context. And that's the con I would say that is the context uh, within which I have lived and worked and tried to uh, guide my personal life too, is within, uh, try to live within the egg diagram, maybe that'd be a way of saying it. But uh, I'm very grateful that I came as a young man onto this way of looking at the world and this vision, so comprehensive, so inclusive, and yet so open, not dogmatic, open to the unknown, to development, to growth at all levels. And it's been, it's been a, a professional home for me for now 50 years and will until I'm, I'm no longer here. So to get to the book, the cover of the book, you've seen it, but I'll just show you again. Interesting painting that I did, actually is one of the first paintings that I did after I started painting. And it's a painting of, the, if you look closely, you can see that that's the earth. And the earth is on fire. And I was looking at that painting the other day and thinking, well, that's a more complex painting now in the sense that when I painted it, it I was trying to express that we as a species or the earth as a living system could become the source of our own spiritual light. In other words, we could become radiant. If we matured as a species, if we grew up, if we learned by simply to love each other and get along and all the things that people are talking about, the earth itself would become radiant and it would let off spiritual light, which I came in the book to call holy fire. So the, the earth potentially could become alive with holy fire and it would need to include everybody. It couldn't be just a certain country or a certain part of the world. It would have to be what I now call the achievement of spiritual maturity, of a species maturity, that we would have to, in a sense, grow spiritually so that was possible. But of course, the complexity of that painting now is that the earth is heating up and there is real fire on the earth and climate change is definitely a threat and an invitation to changing how we live. So the painting has become more complicated for me. It's, it doesn't take away the uh, sense of potential but it also, I think I, as an older person, I'm much more aware of the real challenges and difficulties that we face uh, in arriving at the supreme synthesis or expressing it. So uh, that's, that's enough uh, about the book. Uh, I could only say that I wanted to write it in a way that was informal that was not academic, although it had plenty of information in it. I wanted to include my poetry and paintings as well as my thinking and diagrams and uh, text and um, so that it would give the reader a number of different perspectives within which to look at their own spiritual journey, look at their relationship to their soul um, and uh, I saw the book as an invitation to participate in one's own life more deeply using the book. And I had no idea whether that would be, that would work. 
I had to struggle a lot because I had been trained as an academician. I had to let go of really an academic approach. And um, Linda loves his word, word uh, and, and take a much more experiential approach to the whole pro uh, idea of process and the soul and awakening. Uh, but I did. And it's been interesting that people have used the book that way. They have read it and it's touched or worked in them in some way that takes them closer to whatever they need to experience at the point they are at on their own journey. And I've been getting letters from people in different countries and different walks of life. And it's very reassuring that the book is largely being used that way. Uh, David Elliott, uh, Linda's husband, has said, Tom, that book is psychoactive. In other words, it works in people. And particularly if you read it slowly, it's not a quick read. If you read it slowly, it will take you to the places that you need to go in order to grow. So I, I feel incredibly grateful that I was able to write the book. It took a tremendous amount of work, but it's here. And we're here to um, learn more about it. Okay, so let's, uh, Frederick and Linda, Yes. let's get you in here. And I wanna say these two, I love these two people. And they're wonderful, you know it because you studied with them. They're wonderful human beings. And uh, so it's, when this was suggested that the, the two of you interview me, I, I jumped at the chance, I'm very happy. So why don't each of you say something or, or let's get into the first topic or how yeah. would, let you take the lead yeah. a little bit. I have a mm -hmm. simple yeah. Yeah. We were We were thinking that we will, we will move to some of the really core aspects of your book, but maybe start, if you could just start by just briefly saying something of, about your choice to use the word soul, because that's, that's such a key word in your book. Uh, and you, you, you talk about soul rather than self, and just comment on that briefly. Uh, cool. Well, it, it ties in right with what I was saying before. The reason I chose soul is because it's part of the common parlance. You hear people using the word. You don't hear people using self or higher self. And actually just, I was in the drugstore the other day and I heard a woman said, all I could hear was he had such soulful eyes. That's what I mean. It's like the, lang the, the, the word soul is, evokes an experience that is, it resonates with what the actual experience is. So I felt that soul would take us closer to the experience rather than to an abstract thought about the, the self, the higher self. There are some problems with higher self, I think, because, and you know, we've talked a lot about this. It, it implies hierarchy. Self, which Jung uses certainly is uh, less that way. And there are other, I, other words I could have used, Thich Nhat Hanh, talks about true nature, true self, essence. Uh, but for me, this was suited my purpose. I think also of being a poet and a painter probably made me feel closer to the soul, but it was, it was mostly, um, it was because I thought the common parlance. And interestingly, if you look at the uh, remarks that Roberto makes to me, he doesn't use higher self. He says things like, your soul knows all about it. It's only waiting for you to find out. You know, you trust your soul. So even the, even the, the founder is not using higher self. He's, he's using this word. I think for some of the same reasons. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a brief answer to your question. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, great. I was also <clears throat> thinking, Tom, that you actually already mentioned um, this about experiential presence. Yeah. You made a little remark that I like that, and I do. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, for the reason that you actually, I mean, there are many people talk about presence. Many people use that and the importance of, of, of presence. Right. But you actually talk about something you called experiential presence, and you emphasize um, 
that as a total experience, you mentioned that, that as a total experience, including for the body feel, feelings and mind and infused with soul force. Can you elaborate a little bit about that and okay. say more? Yeah. Well, yes, and I, I, I can link that with what I just said. Yeah. Um, it goes back to uh, a moment when I was watching uh, Bill Moyers interview Joseph Campbell. And I write about this in the book, but I'll say it again here. And Bill Moyers says, uh, Joe, isn't it true that everyone is looking for meaning, for purpose, uh, for direction? And Joseph Campbell stops him and says, Bill, no. What people are looking for is the experience of being fully alive. And he actually, then he goes on and says, the rapture of being fully alive. And again, it was one of those moments, when, it was like when I saw the egg diagram, I said, that's it. The core of the soul is not meaning, it's not purpose, it's not direction, it's vitality, it's sheer aliveness and being. And therefore, that uh, a person who is, oh, let's put it this way. At moments when we're connected to who we most are, which here we're calling the soul, okay? Oh, I, a little aside on that in terms of naming, and then I'll come back to this. It's so important in working with people that you listen and find the words or words by which they describe that experience. Because soul can become something you impose too. The real trick is to listen to how the person describes their own experience. And as they move closer to who they are, and this is, and they brighten and they gain vitality, they're moving closer to who they are to the soul. Then you say, that's, that's it, that's it. So, the, so then I started from that new premise. It doesn't, meaning is derived from vitality, but the soul is aliveness, is full aliveness. Aliveness, which is blocked, which is stunted, which is reduced, which is diminished by all sorts of things, enculturation, trauma, so forth and so on. Because you, you have then, in most cases, a personality that's not able to hold the full vitality of the soul. It's, it's blocked in different ways. And that's why we need to do individual and psychotherapeutic work within a spiritual context so that gradually the personality becomes more and more consistent vehicle of expression of that vitality. So, and then there is a place for meaning and purpose because another idea that I had in the book, have in the book is that within that vitality, there is a, a pattern of spiritual maturity. There's a potential and as that potential is realized, people experience more meaning. So meaning can be a way of getting closer to the soul, but it's not the core experience of the soul. Now, going to Linda's question, that vitality has force. And you can see that in people. It's not a noisy force, but it's a brightening, it's a deepening. You can see it's a certain kind of power in when someone is connected to who they are. It's not power over anybody, but there's vitality and, uh, and, and expression, creative expression or whatever forms they're expressing themselves through. So that, what happens is, well, okay. So as a therapist, what you want to do is you want to welcome that vitality. You want to make room for it. You also want to look at the blocks, but you also, you want to say, welcome soul, it's fine to be here, I see you. And the idea of the soul wound is one that developed around not being seen as a soul. And I won't go there now. But so then the question becomes, and this is coming to what you asked, Linda. If you want the soul to come into the room, so to speak, you need to be in a place where you're connected you need to be in touch with that vital vitality. So that there's a resonance and a welcome between the two of you. This, this, this can happen in a group too, but let's just take it too. So exper the reason experiential presence is so important is because 
your presence welcomes the vitality of the soul, but it has to be fully embodied. And that's where the experiential is important. You can't be present with your head. You can't be present with your mind. I'm, or it's partial presence, it's partial presence. It's also true if you're just emotionally present, but kind of spaced out and not thinking and just counting on your intuition. What has to happen is the soul force of your own soul has to come through your whole personality and be incarnated in your body. When that happens, when you brighten and come alive and are really paying attention, one, the client or the group feels it. So they feel an experiential welcome for who they are, that's one thing. But the other thing is you generate what I call a soul force field, which is the combined energetic field of your two souls together. And as that field grows, then within that, whatever needs to happen, what I call the soul process, will emerge into the present moment and be able to be worked on. So experiential, if you wanna say, experiential presence gives full permission to the soul of the other to appear, including all the blocks that there are that may need to be worked on. And the two of you together are able to work with whatever the next steps in the process are. And I remember uh, someone a long time ago said, when I was first in training in psychosynthesis, she said, you know, psychosynthesis is just two souls talking to each other. And I thought that was, that was a lovely, simple, simple way of saying it. Uh, the other thing, just to add, which um, in terms of where, how are we doing on time? Okay. Soul and personality. And this is something we're right in the middle of now. And the book tried to do it, uh, to try to articulate it, was largely up till now, the soul has been thought about as an epiphenomenon of the second half of life, sort of calling on Jung. After you get your personality in order, then the soul appears. You know, first you learn to disidentify, then you learn to uh, work with trauma, then you strengthen your eye and so forth. And then, and that's true. But what's beginning to emerge as an idea now is that the soul is there from the beginning. It's always there. It's always seeking to, to be expressed and there are always blocks in the way. So uh, Piero Ferrucci and Diana Whitmore in, in um, November did a workshop, maybe some of you went to it, called the decisive shift. And the idea behind that is we need to begin to see people initially as souls and then work to unblock and uh, bring the vitality in and help them with expression and so forth and so on, but not wait till the personality is in order in order then to go to the soul. And Piero and Diane were quite uh, clear about what they call a very decisive shift in the figure ground between soul and personality and how we work with them. So I wanted to put that point in. I think that's a wonderful shift that we're right in the middle of. And the book definitely, uh, you know, if you've read it, 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 it stands in that context. Yeah, yes. and, and Tom, you also speak about in your book, uh, the notion of original intensity speaking about that, that is actually, when you now speak about this all being there from the beginning, you also talk about this original intensity. <clears throat> yeah. Well, any of you have had children, you know, I, I remember my, I remember my, my young boys just so alive. And if you think about birth, in most cases, that is, a, that is a spiritual event precisely because what's there boasting when the child arrives is his or her soul, her vitality. And in fact, it's so powerful that it, it touches the whole family. And you see family pictures of people around a baby, everybody's radiant. So then the soul is there in a sense, quote, from the beginning, then life happens. And life happens at many different levels. People are wounded, enculturated, educated, whatever, traumatized. And th these begin to constitute blocks within the personality and psyche 
to that full expression of the, of, the, of the vitality of the soul. So that's why we sit down with people and work to unblock and develop and grow and all the things that we do. Yeah. So right. <clears throat> what, what really strikes me about, about your book, I mean, one of the things is, is really this, that, that you talk about now that uh, this figure ground that the soul is sort of the figure or the ground uh, is, 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 is through your book and it's through your teaching as I've come to know it. But another thing which is connected to this, uh, which also strikes me, is the groundedness of, of your approach to the transpersonal, that it's not over there, it's really down here. And you use the word descendants, uh, which I find uh, important. And I'm, I haven't really heard, I've, I've heard people talk about imminence, but descendants has a different tone, a different quality. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you mean by descendants? <laughs> you know, uh, well, just just to put aside transcendence and imminence, that that's another experience that's usually referred to as God. God is both transcendent, like greater than any one thing and imminent in the tiny flower and so forth and so on. So, and that's a very powerful experience. And when people have that experience, they realize that the divine is everywhere. The macrocosm, microcosm, poetry is made of that and so forth. But this is different. What I saw and including in psychosynthesis is two things. One, the tremendous value of teaching within a psychological context, how to transcend. We call it disidentify. The Buddhists call it mindfulness, okay? But within psychosynthesis, there was all the psychological detail of the personality and the psyche and the history that we could learn to step back from. And that was tremendously liberating. I mean, that's just Roberto's contribution of disidentification Many other people are using it now, but I think he was the first person who formulated that word. It's invaluable. And it's led to a great deal of learning and growing. At the same time, it's led to sometimes over transcending or spiritual bypass or uh, transcending the personality and getting caught in the superconscious rather than getting to the soul. And there, there has been, in, generally in spiritual culture uh, over the last 50 years, there's been emphasis on kind of getting above and out. And that somehow the, the meaning or the connection or whatever, as you were saying, Frederick, is somewhere else. So uh, that in its worst form actually can lead to cult uh, form, you know, cult formation and all sorts of distortions. But I do want, I just want to say, I love uh, transcendence. It's wonderful, rightly used. Okay. But I, so in the book, I, as I'm thinking about the soul force, the vitality, and that it being grounded, whether it's an experiential presence or in our behavior, in some ways to use Asajoli's terms, thinking more about the will, I said, I think it would be useful to formulate a complementary principle called descendants that is the experience of the soul descending and expressing itself more and more fully within the context of daily life, body feelings and mind, relationships, so forth and so on. Coming, and David Spangler, who is someone who is very interested in what he calls incarnational spirituality uh, has said, the problem is we're not incarnated enough. We're not fully here. We haven't really worked out how to be fully here. And so I coined the term descendants to try to create a complementary balance from with transcendence. So with a client, some clients do need to learn how to disidentify. And they do need to get to a deeper self and so forth. But there are other people who are already too much there or caught in the superconscious. And what they really need is to 
as souls to descend and find ways to express themselves more and more fully. It's kindred to the spiritual will. If you think about the soul having an intention, having a calling, having a purpose, a, a desire to express in life, then that principle of descendants would work to help the person do that. And the way you would probably do that in working with people would be particularly if maybe this doesn't happen anymore, but in California in the old days, everybody wanted to go somewhere else, you know, and preferably higher. It would be if you have a, someone who has that tendency would be to keep them down on the ground and keep them going into their pain or their suffering or whatever uh, was needed to experience to unblock the flow of soul force so it could come fully into the world. So we'll see, it's a new term. We'll see if it takes, whether it's useful, I, I have no idea, but it was very useful to me. And the other thing I could say, no, I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait, yeah. So both and as often yeah. is the yeah. case in psychosynthesis, transcendence yeah. and, and descendance. Also, client to client, what does this person really need? And I'll just show you one story, which is traumatic, but it, it certainly, a client uh, uh, sat down, this is a long time ago, but he sat down and he said, this is my last lifetime on the wheel of birth and death. Oh, oh that's interesting. <laughs> and I, so we start working and he was very much into the wheel of birth and death and he, create, he had completed all his karma and so forth and so on. Well, the poor man, he, he was in a huge amount of pain. He couldn't hold a job. Uh, he was having trouble in his re relationships. And he, he, was, he was miserable, really. And he was ungrounded to what Frederick's talking about. He was ungrounded. So what I did was I, I didn't go with the wheel of birth and death. I just kept him into his immediate experience, held him in his immediate experience. And his immediate experience was very painful. But he trusted me enough to stay with the pain and, and to begin to look at some of the trauma that had led to this premature transcendence. And gradually over a period of a year or so, he came down. And I'm happy to report now 40 years later, he's married, he's a good therapist in Boston uh, and he's a much happier man than he was when I first saw him. So maybe that is a dramatic example, but I hope that it would illustrate uh, what I'm talking about. And in a way, when you say that um, working with soul presses is attending deeply to immediate experience, whatever that is, uh, right. it, it's really, it's a non-dual way. I mean, it's not like there's psychological work and then there's spiritual work. It's like all the work is spiritual if you hold it in full presence right yeah. and, I, and i think that that that's another point in the book that is um important to me uh it's just really what you're saying is that in a non-dual way i think what I, i'm proposing as a way of working with people is through experiential presence the generating of the soul force field come into the present moment and help a person experience what's happening in that present moment. And, you know, Gestalt therapy does that. There are many things to do it, but the thing that's added is in a non-dual way, the soul or paradoxical way, I call it the soul paradox, is that the soul is both transcendent, like it's guiding the process. It's guiding what comes into the present moment, but also the soul is embedded in the experience itself. So that from that point of view, all you have to do, and that's easy to say, hard to do, all you have to do is to stay in the moment with whatever the soul is delivering into the present moment and work with that. That will be the next step on that person's spiritual journey. He or she doesn't have to go anywhere else other than into the present moment. Now, in a number of spiritual disciplines that there's cooperation with that, it, but it what's, I think what's powerful about this, those cooperations don't include the psychological work. They don't include the details of working within the present moment in the soul force field 
as spiritual work. So as you're saying, Frederick, there's not a split. It's, there's a soul coming in the present moment and our, through our own presence supporting and that, that process. Yeah. How are we doing? I wish I could see you. I see a lot of names and I'm sure you're all, how many are you now? There's 74 of you, my God. Uh, having all sorts of thoughts. Nobody's turned off their... their <laughs> it's, it's probably time soon to, to, to take questions from the participants. Do you want to put one more question first, Linda, before we do that? Or? Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking um, if that is right or not. I mean, but I just want to emphasize something maybe and then see if that resonates in you, Tom. Maybe just emphasize this about... Uh, I like the no I like this notion so much the, to be rooted in being to be do to be deeply rooted. rooted rooted in being because in a way that just that word rooted and in being in right. a way summarizes exactly what you're saying about that it's no difference between the so-called higher and to be fully here and to be deeply rooted and descendant and to be incarnated, to be deeply rooted in being. So to bring the word root and being together like you do, I really like that. Yeah. The foundation of it all, you say, is to be deeply rooted in being. I love that so love much. You. Beautiful. <laughs> and you know, Linda, just to, to, to th I've been thinking about this actually in terms of the chakras, is that the root chakra is the, is the, is the chakra of vitality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another way of looking at the chakra system, besides that you want to get to the crown chakra, mm -hmm. is that you want to get to the root chakra. And if you get to the root chakra, which means you descend through all the other things and reorganize your life so that your spiritual force flows through them, mm -hmm. you get to the root chakra, which is your vitality, is your root vitality, mm -hmm. your aliveness. Mm -hmm. and so you have uh, a spirituality that is very alive. It also is very unique to each person. I think this is another thing is that we've all seen spirituality sold uh, or packaged, I guess, packaged in a way that uh, says, if you just do this, if you do this, this will happen and so forth and so on. This way of working with people, and I think psychosynthesis at its best really affirms it. Yes. And oh, the other thing that Asher Jolie says in that video, I know I wanted to get that in. He, he says, he describes what psychosynthesis is, the movement and so forth. And then he says uh, something to the effect of, we must start with the lived reality of the patient. The lived reality of the patient. And he said, uh, the patient is our teacher. He or she will teach us what they need. And then he said, then we can use whatever techniques are appropriate to help with that need. And he himself says uh, something to the effect of some uh, some techniques, psychosynthetic techniques may not be used, needed and others that aren't. He said, you can make them up on the spot. Yes. So he's really talking about an existential, res existential experiential response in the present moment to the felt need, the living reality of the client and staying there and let this, the process, what I call the soul process, unfold from there. So again, in this way of working, there's nowhere to go. And in a sense, there's nothing to do because once you get that soul process moving, who's guiding that soul process? The soul, not you. And what does Roberto say about the soul? The soul knows all about it. It's only waiting for you to find out. So the process then of therapy or education becomes the person discovering who they are. Anyway, I'm so glad. Thank you for that question. Because I, this, this, I recommend, if you don't do anything else, Google Roberto 
Asajoli interview dash Evarts. Is Evarts a Swedish name? Uh, yeah, Evert, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Evarts Loomis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And watch that five minutes and you will see everything you need to know about psychism. Yeah. Um, but it's so important, Tom, that you emphasize that whatever can be used. So not get stuck into certain techniques or, or to even call, oh, this is the holy toolbox I have now yeah. with the psychosynthesis techniques. You can do whatever. It's not that is not important. That's uh, useful, but it's not the foreground. Again, of the work. It's, again it's, it's, it's uh, both and because the more tools you know, the more skill you will have. Sure. But yes. if you use this tool that go, goes against the process, it's not useful. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. And the other thing, if you are in the soul force field, if you're connected to, to what we're calling experiential presence, your soul will know what to do. And I, I remember in, in old days when I was learning this, I would be working with someone and I'd hear a voice that said, ask her about her mother. And my first response would be, I can't do that. So we go on then, ask her about her mother. No, it's, it's inappropriate. She's doing this other thing. And if I heard the voice three times, I did it. And it was always the best thing to do. So your own intuition is coming through that vitality of presence. You're guided too. So then you have two souls talking with each other. Essentially, that's what it is. Anyway, okay. Right, so, so let's, uh, I think Annika is going to read some questions from the chat, so. Yes, and we have actually not gotten any questions yet in the chat. So I was just thinking that maybe uh, if people would like to turn on their camera just so that we all can get a feeling of each other if you like to for a little short while and then the reason why we have the cameras turned off is for Tom to actually see um, all of us, or Linda and Frederick. But Tom, I, in the meantime, I have gotten a few uh, questions in beforehand while people are thinking on questions. I've gotten a few questions beforehand on email. And one of them is, uh, I think you have already touched upon it, but still, there was this interesting question. Um, what is actually the soul? And I think you started already, but again. Oh, well, that's a great question. What is the soul? Uh, the soul is mysterious. Aliveness, soul, vitality. The soul is wild in the way of natural wildness. In other words, we can't say for sure. We can't say. It seems to be a source of vitality, of meaning, uh, of creativity, of identity. Uh, it can be, uh, if, you, if, you, if you move into a, a religious context, it, it can be a conduit to God, uh, but it can also just be a connection to the great spirit. In other words, it, it seems to be, it's, it's, our, it's who, I, I mean, how, how do you say this? I guess I would say it's who, who we are at our best, who we most deeply are as human beings, uh, it holds a pattern of our spiritual and psychological maturity. And it has the force for the expression, the development and expression of that maturity. I, in the book, I say it's comparable to the nucleus of a cell. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that it has a governing influence on the life. And actually a cell that becomes ill does not respond to the nucleus it becomes ungovernable, cancer cell becomes ungovernable. So maybe that's a good way of saying it, that it's the governing and guiding principle within the human being that is rooted in the universe or rooted in, let's put it this way, rooted in something larger. And yet it's very particular, it's very particular to the person no two souls are alike. It's like all the snowflakes, uh, you know, the structure of the snowflakes, there's no one snowflake that's like any other. And yet we're all snowflakes. So I don't, does that help? Yeah. You're thinking about the quote at the end of your emails, Tom, your special quote. Yeah. 
Can you read that? <laughs> you know what it is. You can read it. <laughs> do you want me to read it? Sure, if you have it right there. I do, yes. The stunning paradox of human spiritual maturity is that as we become one with all life, we also at the same time become completely and uniquely ourselves. So it's both and again. And it's paradoxical. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so beautiful because so many spiritual teachings have say you have to give up your individuality. You have to join something larger by sacrificing. And that's, of course, that's true because that's what happens is that you, but you don't give up, you let go of who you are in the lesser identified ways. And as you let go, and this is something that happens with aging, let me tell you, as you let go, it's not like suddenly there's nothing there. There is something there that's who you are. But then what happens is all those things that you let go of can still be of use. It's not as if they disappear and you certainly don't have to uh, get rid of them. In fact, anything you try to get rid of will sneak up and find you again. So that's, that's the whole process of awakening, which we haven't talked about this time, but I, I'm working with now people, older people, and I am an older person too. And that is what's happening is the things I thought were so important and was identified with, they're just disappearing. And you, if you read my book, you, you could feel initially that was tremendously disorienting to me. So how can I be letting go of these things? But I'm, I've lived enough now to know that there's something here that I am so much more grateful for than all those things. And yet here I am teaching and talking. So I haven't stopped teaching. Anyway, it's paradoxical, but that's, uh, it's so beautiful that the individuality can be lived in a way that it becomes held by a larger context or a larger energy, I guess that's the way to say it. And by the way, this is just an aside, but the other thing in the book, I, I mentioned again and again, beauty. And I think that is a way of thinking about human beauty is that the deepest human beauty is when a person is both very much herself and connected to the larger whole. There's a certain quality of beauty that comes out. It's different than cosmetic beauty. It's different than cultural or social beauty. It's something radiant, something beautiful. That's, to me, beauty is uh, one of the deepest signs of the soul in, in the way I'm talking about it right here. All right. Yes. <laughs> I have, uh, I have a couple of more questions, uh, Tom. Yeah. Uh, and I think, first of all, I would like to say that I think technology uh, tonight is sort of manifesting its soul into our group here for, because some people cannot turn, off, turn on their cameras and others can. So I think we have a very playful soul with a lot of vitality here in the group, the technology part of it. But anyways, uh, a, a very interesting question from one of the participants. Um, do you think that even the animals, uh, sort of the animal world, do have a soul? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, because, my, uh, you know, Sven, he's soulless. wonderful question. And I would say, well, I would put it this way. I do think that there's a collective soul energy that holds us all, whatever you want to call that. And that all of us participate in that, including the animals and including plants, and including the earth itself. So in that sense, in, in that first sense, you can say, yes, uh, we all have souls. But the interesting thing is, I think that there's a vast differentiation, just the way there is a differentiation with human, within human beings as to the nature and quality of their soul and what they're seeking to express, so too with the animals. So you have this paradox of, in a sense of, if you wanna call it solar unity and intensely huge diversity and differentiation. 
And that certainly would be between the species and it certainly would be within the species. Those of you who had dogs, okay? Are any of the two or three dogs you've had in your life the same? No, they have distinct personalities, but they also, I mean, dogs have wonderful souls. You know, they're loving, loving beings, and, unless they're trained out of it. So, you know, that's my best, uh, yeah. it's not even an answer. It's just response. <laughs> And I think to follow up on that, there's another question on related in a way, and that is how we can relate to nature in a soul level. And, and if so, find a more sustainable way of living on this planet. What, what are your thoughts on that? How can we re relate to the soul in nature? Yeah, how can we relate to the nature on a soul level? Uh, yeah. And in, in if, if that relation is possible, how could that help uh, to, to living a more sustainable life on this planet? Oh, it's a fabulous question. You know, it's funny because I was just thinking about this yesterday because <clears throat> I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about experiential presence and, uh, and generating a field. And then I was, uh, what Linda was talking about, I was thinking, what if we called it a field of being? because at root it is being. So really when I sit down with a human being, I am, I am rooting myself in a field of being that can invite and welcome the being of the other person. So why can't I do that with a tree? And there are people who do this. You know, in Finhorn, there were Dorothy McLean talked to the divas and grew incredible vegetables. Uh, there, are, there are studies of trees now, uh, forests as living systems with souls, with vitality and with communication. Uh, so I think, I, I would actually interest myself, could I sit down, I have a beautiful maple tree where we live. What if I sat down and in a sense, went into a field of being and then listened? I, I wonder, would I be able to hear what the maple tree was saying to me? But it might well. So, uh, what can I say? We need to change our relationship to nature 180 degrees. We have not been listening to the planet. We have not been listening to nature. You know, you know all the data, species extension, extinction, you know, climate change, so forth and so on. Somehow our species has been completely cut off, except with some exceptions of people. I think you Swedes are much closer to nature, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, we need to learn something very different. And maybe it, 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 it means learning how to create a field of being and listen to other mm. species and hear what they have to say and how they're suffering and what we can do about that. Yeah. Fabulous question. Yeah, Those there are. There are Let, there Linda, in. Yeah. Frederick, you want to say anything about these questions that have come up? No, I, 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 I was just thinking when you, when you talked about listening to to the living living planet that um there is something in relation to nature but also in relation to people and in relation to the self ourselves which has to do with the willingness to to be with pain mm -hmm. and to see that also as part of of spiritual maturity uh that the journey is not is not only light and joy. Uh, hopefully, that's part of it too. But there's something about the willingness to be with the pain. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and how we bring in that when we teach global psychosynthesis very much at the academy and the importance of stepping in to 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 open up and to be able to hold, as Frederick says, to contain that grief. Um, right. Also, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about that the, the earth needs us to right. hear us, needs us to hear how the earth is crying. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's a, all about this rootedness in being, I think, as you speak about, and also has to do with cosmos, as you also bring in in your book, and how we can, if we know who we are, 
and also what we are and the interconnectedness, then and also development in the personality goes along that side. Uh, maybe we will stop also ultimately, but it starts with one person, one person at a time. The importance of doing this work one person at a time. Uh, very much. Yeah. You, also you know, and that I just, that you remind me of another point, which I think is changing here, uh, is that in the past, we have tended to look to somewhere else to solve the problems. Uh, whether it's a government or a leader. And uh, there hasn't been a clear connection between the micro microcosmic and macrocosmic processes. And this goes back to Astrogioli's quote at the beginning. He's saying that all, at all these levels, the process of psychosynthesis, which he, he posited with a small p, the process from moment to moment, the process of growth and so forth is happening at all levels, leading to the supreme synthesis or what he called a new civilization, which would be a planetary civilization. So we, we certainly mostly have thought, well, someone else is gonna do that or this regime or this leader or whatever. And it seems to me it's clear and clear that there's a direct responsibility, a direct connection between our personal responsibility for how we live our lives and that process at the macro level. And mm -hmm. people, unfortunately, I mean, the pandemic, not only that, there've been other crises, but certainly the pandemic has been inviting people to take much more personal responsibility yeah. for their own lives. And uh, I love his little phrase where he says, uh, some many reluctant and unwilling and rebellious in our country, I don't know how it's been there, but." You know, we have these people who will not wear masks and, and you know, want to be free and so forth and so on. This is, uh, this is immature behavior in the face of it. And we've lost 500,000 people here. 500,000 people have died because of the political differences and because of this refusal to see the larger whole and participate in it. So there's a huge need for each of us to ask that question how are we related to the larger whole, to nature, to the planet, to sustainability? And how can we shape and live our lives so we contribute to that pr progress toward the supreme synthesis? Or more likely, we should also ask, how are we in the way? What are we doing? Maybe with good enough intentions and so forth, but what are we doing that really is creating difficulty? And that may not, that may be something personal, but it may also be something cultural or collective that we need to really do differently. So I love that we, we've come, I think we're getting pretty close to the end, but we've come to this thing because it's where we started. That's why I read those uh, quotes because this is what psychosynthesis is about. What we're talking about here doesn't mean that everything we've learned about the individual level isn't completely necessary. But this is the context. And you know, this has only gotten more and more obvious over the last 20 or 30 years. It's always been the case, but now we're really up against it. And I think I was talking to some a couple of young people the other day, the ones who interviewed me. Uh, one was in Sydney, Australia, and the other was in California. And I'm here on the East Coast I'm talking about this and, and just encouraging you said, you know, psychosynthesis has the potential to make a huge contribution to what's needed on the planet now. It's a matter of finding the right forms, the right language, and the right ways of moving so that it can make its contribution. But in Roberto's initial vision, it's all there. And not just the, not just the uh, planetary supreme synthesis, because what I told you, the patient is your teacher. He was pointing to what I call soul process that, and what Linda's talking about with the experiential presence and, and Frederick's talking about as working in the moment. It's all in the moment. And Roberto was saying that. He was saying the patient, the moment is the teacher and let go of everything else, be present to that. And then you'll know exactly what to do. 
because your soul knows all about it. It's the only way for you to find out. <laughs> and of course, we're always finding out and we always make mistakes. And the other thing he said was, is, he said this to me because I was struggling so much with wanting to do it perfectly. He say, oh my dear, he said, you are perfectly imperfect. So if there's one thing we share, it's that we're imperfect, right? Perfectly so, which means we can be with each other and grow with each other and support each other and be connected to each other. We don't have to compete with each other and that this is what the planet needs. And you have actually, just to get down to, you have an association of these two institutes, Gottenberg and, and uh, Stockholm, and you have, I don't know how many people in the association altogether, but oh, 50, 50, 60, 70, 72 people showed up here. What a potential you have. And I want to encourage you to be with each other and work with each other and, and enjoy each other's company in this spirit. And I'll come along for the ride. I'll show up every once in a while. So Frederick, Linda, how, where are we in the agenda? Yeah, Annika, do you have any more questions? I do. Uh, I yeah. do. So maybe, yeah. I, uh, there's one question, I think a little, there has been in the chat also, we'd like to say uh, a lot of uh, movement around this. Um, uh, our relationship between between uh, or the, our soul's relationship with Mother Nature or the planet and, yeah. and so. But I would like to move to another area. There was a question: Would you agree, Tom, that we need a strong contact with our own souls in order to bear, bear how do you say bear, uh, sustain the pain in the world? And at the same time, uh, keep our vitality. Hold on. What was the last part? No, the bit of the pain of the world. And keep still keep our own vitality. So in order to keep our own vitality and yeah. how do you say, utada, um, uh, um, Linda, utada. Yeah, bear. Bear. Bear, bear the, um, the pain in the world. Yeah. So is a strong contact with the soul needed in order to do that? Well, I mean, the strong contact with the soul is a good thing, not only for bearing pain, but also bearing joy. In other words, it would be, if you put it this way, going back to what Linda said, it would be to learn again to bear your original intensity perhaps you had as a child so it would be the full range of feeling it wouldn't be i'll say something about the pain in just a minute but it would be some people have as much trouble bearing joy as they do pain some people are identified with their pain and cut off from their joy and so it's more a strong soul is needed to hold the full spectrum of human experience let's put it that way yeah then luckily we're saved by the principle of transformation. If we're willing to bear the pain, i.e. go into it, you know, all the things that we know how to do and stay with it, not create a reaction formation that takes us away from it, not have a drink to kill it, not, you know, whatever it is, that pain lived will transform. So it doesn't stay pain. Mm. It doesn't stay pain. You have to be willing to bear it. But once you're willing to bear it and breathe with it, it doesn't stay there. It moves. You, you know, you've seen again and again, if someone comes up against really a hard thing, they bear it. And let's say they weep. They just did grief and they weep and they weep. And, uh, and then the weeping finally ends and so forth. And then you say, what do you experience now? So well, I feel I feel relieved. That's one step. Stay with that relief. See what else happens. Well, you know what's happening. I feel lighter. And I, you know, I something's happening. Well, just stay with that. What is it? Well, you know, I feel that was really a courageous thing for me to do. How do you experience courage? Well, my body 
relaxes. I feel my heart is strong. I can look you in the eye rather than looking away, so forth and so on. What has happened? The pain has transformed into courage. And always there's a super conscious quality waiting to come in. So if you have, for example, I talk about this in the book, but if someone is struggling with pain, uh, with fear, as they're willing to bear the fear and work with it and so forth, the quality of sensitivity and tenderness will come in. If it's anger, very often it's power. So thank God or whomever is running the show, uh, the principle of transformation allows us, it makes it easier, Annika, to bear the pain because we're not gonna be stuck in it. In fact, if we don't bear it, we are stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the opposite. Okay, can I take another question? Is it okay? Sure. Uh, this, this is a question on if you uh, have noticed, Tom, during your uh, professional life, an increased interest in transpersonal therapy? Well, yes, over the course of the 50 years, you know, when, when we started, when we started, one, we were in California. So we were, that was where all the flakes and the granolas went in California. And uh, the, uh, the traditional establishment would have nothing to do with us. However, what, what was very interesting was that was certainly true, but in the training institutes, and this happened, I'll talk about my own experience. I came back East to Boston to teach, which is a quite a conservative uh, medical and theological place. And I was, had a training program just outside of Boston. People began to show up from these big institutions, Harvard, MIT, BU, and so forth and so on to study psychosynthesis. And they would say, this is what I do when the door is closed, but I would never tell my supervisor. And it was marvelous. I had the most wonderful people who came, but they were all mavericks. They were people whose natural tendency to work with a spiritual dimension, they had to suppress because of the psychological professional culture. Now, over the 50 years that has changed and it's changed in a good way and a not so good way. The good way is that really there is more interest in the spiritual dimension and in integrating it with the psychological, not just in psychosynthesis, but in mainstream psychology, definitely. And medical, medical education is changing so forth and so on. The problem, and maybe this isn't a problem in Sweden, but the problem here is it has become a thing so you get all sorts of programs on spirituality that are, are superficial, basically. It's an overused word. And actually soul, they're not using it so much anymore. I'm glad to see, but for a while, everything was soul. Soul retrieval, soul this, soul that, so forth. So it, it was a tendency toward a fad. And what we need, we need serious, and responsible, humane work to develop our understanding about how these different mm -hmm. dimensions work with each other and toward the movement to a harmonious and cooperative, I forget what he said, characterized by the spirit of synthesis. We'll get that. And again, talking about psychosynthesis, I think psychosynthesis is just beginning. And I think that in the right hands, in the right way, over the next 50 years, it could really make a major contribution because it has that potential to, in a mature way, to hold the complexity and depth and beauty of the process of spiritual and psychological development. I don't say more so than other places because it doesn't depend on any place, including psychosynthesis. But psychosynthesis has made and could continue to make a real contribution. And it depends on you and me uh, and, uh, and the people you're teaching now and the, that three-year-old who's uh, on a playground on a swing right now, but she's gonna get interested in psychosynthesis in 20 years. So. She's going to be a therapist. Positive. And I think Ash Jolie would be totally, he'd say, absolutely. You know, some people, there's, 
Unfortunately, maybe you, you, you've seen it. There's a certain orthodox wing in psychosynthesis, which says what's good enough for acetyl is good enough for us. <laughs> he would be the last. He would be the last. And I remember uh, at a summer institute, uh, one of his first colleagues in New York came. He was old man, Frank Aronian. And we were, Frederick might have been there. There were people from Europe and it was a big group of people. And Frank said to me, he was so excited to be there as an old person. We were all the young people then. And he said, Tom, Roberto would be so excited. I say, why? Because the ideas of psychosynthesis, the principles are everywhere. They're not called psychosynthesis necessarily, but they're everywhere in the culture. And that's true. So next 50 years, do we have 50 years? I don't know. But it's worth a try. It's worth keeping going. And again, I want to encourage you. You have an organization. You have two institutes. Sweden is a, a wonderful place with intelligent people in it and committed people. And I know you have problems too. But you could be a force. You could be a force on the planet. You could. I'm serious. Yeah. And it's given the telecommunications nice. now, the sky's the limit. Anyway, that's my pep beautiful. talk. Is that, that your beautiful. final words? The sky is the limit. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, Annika, is that maybe the last from the participants? Maybe yeah. that will be. There are more questions, but I think that yeah. we'll, it's okay as the last. What do you th say, Fred? That's like a, good, maybe... it's a good note to end yeah. on, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So, so just to just to wrap it up a little bit, Tom. Yeah. And uh, if if you were about to, if you got the challenge to kind of distill down your book into just one or two sentences that would feel like the core or the heart or the soul of the book, what would you say? I know it's not an easy question. What would you say? What would you? What would that be? Put it in a distillery, and what would come out? What will, what will be there in the, in the vessel? That's a great question, Linda. Mm. What comes now? What comes right? Yeah, I, I was, I, I would say, the book is about the phrase that comes: inherent interconnectedness of all beings. Yes. Inherent. In a sense, it's inherent, it's there. You don't, have to, there. You don't have to impose it. You don't have no. to yes. make it happen. It's inherent to the life. Yes. And then uh, that experience of in, inherent interconnectedness of all, of all generates all love. Beings. It generates it love. Generates so love. again, mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. You don't even have to be loving. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a byproduct of of that experience you know the term i use in the book so is yes, yeah, yeah. but that's just a term it's, i made up in order to try to describe that so i would say, say, say again what did you say cosmos so yes, that's the term yes. that i made up but or, or got stole from pythagoras stole from pythagoras that's better yeah, but no that, and then the third one was that, <laughs> they're related so interconnectedness uh Spontaneous love. I, I think we are as in our nature loving. So we don't have to do anything about that. We need to remove the blocks to that. And then the third thing, I think this universe and this world uh, is beautiful. So the first line of the book is, this book is about human beauty. So I think the quality of beauty, the world is suffused with beauty. It's that we don't see it or we destroy it. And if we could learn to be interconnected inherently and to love accordingly, we would have the that perception of how beautiful creation is, how beautiful this world is. And the blessing is that it keeps being beautiful, even though we, Mess it up. 
so generous. The world is so, the earth is so generous to us in terms of what she gives us every day. It's unbelievable. Despite all the things we're, we're doing or not doing. So that would be my answer to your question, Linda. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's wonderful. I really just want to stay with the very first line with you, that, that you said, because that was so beautiful and powerful. That the first thing that came, the, inter, the inherent, inherent interconnectedness with all beings. Right. And that generates love. Love and beauty and the beauty and our perception of beauty. Yeah. yeah. The, inter, the inherent interconnectedness with all beings. So really let people, everyone that hears that now, let you let you soak soak that in with all of your body and full experience <laughs> presence, soaking it in through your body, feelings and mind. What Tom says here, the inherent interconnectedness with all beings. Yes, we are inherently interconnected. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. It is time for, Frederick, would you like to say something before we wrap up this evening? No, the only, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to do this and thank you Tom for being so generous with with your time and your presence and sharing um, and uh, I'm just I'm just sorry that I haven't been able to see everyone who's participating because the screen can't can't hold so many pictures but I know there's a lot of lot of people that I know out there and, and some that I don't know so thank you <laughs> And I thought, Tom, uh, just as a final uh, word from, and I think you get some hearts here in the screen if you see, but, and that's also what I wanted to say that maybe if you have the ability to, and the possibility to just um, look a bit on or in the eyes as, as good as it gets in these small pictures and just receive the love from all the Swedish, very grateful, uh, psychosynthesis uh, practitioners here. You can go to gallery, gallery view. Yes, in the top of your screen, there's to the right is this gallery view and you can scroll if you like. Oh. Thank you, Tom. Really, You're thank you very much. You're so welcome. I guess we're at the end. So. Yes, there are two minutes. So thank you so much. Uh, and thank you everybody for participating. And uh, I at least heard Tom saying that he might be back. So I don't know if anybody else heard, but I heard. So. No, I said that. Uh, I, I, as I said, I, well, I've enjoyed my times in Sweden over the last 30 years and the people I've met and I feel connected to you and within the limits of my ability as an old man, uh, I'd love to find ways to stay connected to your community and contribute to it. I'm, so yes, no, that's, that's a serious offer. Yeah. Thank you. I will not forget. And again, thanks to all members. So wonderfully heartwarming to see all the faces as well.
really special. And Linda, Frederick, uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening and have a good day, Tom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.